Hey, everyone. Thanks so much for joining me on the Slice of Healthcare podcast. I'm your host, Jared Taylor. On today's episode, I'm speaking with Russ Thomas, the CEO at Availity. Russ, how are you today? Hey, Jared. Great. Thanks for having me. Excited for us to chat. I think we should dive right into it. We usually like to keep these nice, short and sweet for our listeners. If uh, you could tell the audience a little bit about your background, then we'll go into a little bit about Availity. And then there's a couple of things you and I want to discuss here today. So, yeah, my background is pretty uh, straightforward, Jared. I'm, uh, I'm the happiest ex-lawyer you've ever met. I practiced uh, law in my first career and did that for the better part of a decade and then got smart and left the law and joined a little healthcare technology company in Tampa, I think near, probably near where, where you are and had a great run there, a little company called Gold Standard. Um, clinical decision support, clinical knowledge bases really sort of built my early interest in how do you drive good clinical content, clinical information um, into the hands uh, of providers. Uh, had a great run there, sold that business in 2006 to Reed Elsevier, uh, you know, big multinational uh, content information business. And I uh, got the opportunity in 2008, uh, 2007 to join Availity as the chief operating officer. I uh, did that, had a nice run there for four years under our founder, a woman named Julie Clapstein, who was just phenomenal, and uh, took over as CEO in uh, 2011, I want to say, into 2011, beginning of 2012, and been here and loving it ever since. And a lot of people in the industry understand, you know, know about Ability. If they, if they don't know the ins and outs, they've heard of Ability, right? But yep. for those that maybe haven't, which... Uh, uh, it would be great if you could just give us kind of the quick intro on Availity as well. Yeah, I mean, in our, at our core, Jared, we're, we're connective tissue between health plans and providers. That's what we do, right? We connect plans and providers through a multimodality approach um, so that they can exchange uh, critical you know, health information. Uh, the vast majority of that information is um, structured, what we would call sort of administrative transactional data. It's claims and remits and benefits determinations and uh, and authorizations and referrals and you know, all the building block uh, sort of core standardized transactions of the business relationship between health plans and providers. Uh, over the last several years, we've uh, moved into um, what I think are very exciting new data types, unstructured data, clinical data, medical data, you know, information that providers and payers need to share in order to really drive better outcomes, better costs, better efficiencies between plans and providers. Um, we do that at fairly uh, large scale. We have 2 million active providers in our network. Um, we'll transact, you know, over 13 billion transactions through our network this year and um, a lot of economic activity. If you look at sort of total value of claims billed through availability this year to uh, from providers to, to payers is well over $2 trillion of uh, billed claims um, value through our network. So pretty, uh, you know, pretty broadly deployed through the industry and think we're at a very critical and, you know, uh, um, intermediary uh, between plans and providers. Which, which kind of leads me into my my first like main question for you today is historically why have basically providers and payers have a strained relationship? Yeah, yeah, it's a great question, Jared. And you know, I have I'm I'm very opinionated on this topic. Um, so I'll share my my opinions here, which aren't always the opinions of Availity, but certainly are are, are my opinions. I guess they are the opinions of Availity since they're mine. Um, so I think there's two things that, that, that drive that. One, um, you know, healthcare lags dramatically behind in, uh, in the utilization of technology to create um, transparency in the business relationship or the medical relationship between plans, providers, and, you know, you and I as patients, right? The things that we accept in healthcare as, uh, as standard um, are, you know, woefully behind almost any other sector of the economy, right? Healthcare is, is single-handedly keeping the facts industry um, alive. And I think that that lack of, of successful execution of a, of a 21st century technology strategy creates a lot of opacity in healthcare that creates confusion and conflict. And, you know, when uncertainty exists, people sometimes, uh, you know, assume the worst. And I think that's what happens a lot of time in the relationship between plans and providers is that lack of trust is driven by 
um, a lack of quality information to the right person at the right time. So I think that's, I think that's part of it. I, I think another part of it, quite frankly, is there's a cohort of vendors um, in healthcare today that have very much, as you would expect, um, taken advantage of um, that strained relationship and created what I sometimes uh, speak of as sort of this arms race um, between providers and health plans. You know, a, a health plan will implement a, u, a new, you know, utilization management, uh, you know, denial management application, and a provider on the other side implements a new coordination of benefits uh, service. And, you know, it's theoretically, it's all designed to get, you know, right money to the right provider, you know, for the for treating the right patient at the right time. But I think there's been a real breakdown of collaboration um, and that has allowed, you know, a lot of businesses and, uh, to, to thrive that, you know, in my view, frankly, uh, should not. If we had a true, you know, real time, transparent, uh, collaborative relationship between plans and providers, I think it would be um, detrimental to candidly a lot of the vendors in the in the market today. And, and that's part of our mission. And we can talk about that as much as you want. But, you know, part of our mission is to eliminate that friction, eliminate that abrasion and to drive real time information uh, at the point of care or at the point of service um, so that you get to the right answer faster and can avoid a lot of downstream complexity. So, so let's play off that a little bit, both the answer and then the, the comment that you just made. So you, you kind of told us about why they have the strained relationship. Now, can you kind of give us the the, the breakdown of how Availity's technology comes into play to, to help solve that kind of yeah. strained relationship? Yeah, yeah absolutely. So, um, so, so first and foremost, I don't think this is a technology problem. Um, you know, there is so much good technology out there. There are great startup companies that are de that have developed and are implementing some just phenomenal tech. I think there are underlying business model constraints um, that have slowed the process and the wave of technology adoption. And, you know, candidly, I think there are cultural uh, issues that just make it, you know, hard for sometimes for um, newer companies to, you know, sort of break into this monolithic, uh, you know, system that we call um, U.S. healthcare. So from where we sit, right, sort of go back to where I started, right, that availability sits in, I think, this unique uh, position between plans and providers where we are exchanging, you know, data between them. We serve as the gateway for, you know, candidly, Jared, you know, close to 50% of all health plans in the country leverage availability as their gateway. So we literally get first view of every transaction, every piece of information that comes into a plan. So where we are focused now as a company is how do we leverage that relationship and that, you know, very, very um, significant volume of interaction between providers and, and, and payers and evolve the market from a transactional market to a true patient centric interaction driven model. So I'll use some, some real examples, right? Billions of dollars in post claim submission, post pay, uh, what are, you know, payment integrity, right? Uh, is the, the, the sort of industry buzzword for it, but it's provider submitted a claim, payer adjudicated a claim, payer paid the claim, provider reconciled. So just like in your business or mine, at the end of the month, you reconcile. And then weeks, if not months later, uh, someone shows up, a vendor shows up at the provider's front door and says, oh, by the way, these claims that were paid, we believe are paid inappropriately or wrongly or inaccurately, and now we need to claw dollars uh, back uh, from you. Well, I, you know, we couldn't run our business uh, like that. And providers would say the same thing, that they spend all this time. I mean, you look at the half a trillion dollars of waste in Ministry of Waste and Healthcare, and so much of that is driven by this inefficiency. So to answer your question, where do we play, right? Our objective is to take those uh, interactions and to look downstream at what's causing the, the error or the flaw or the inaccuracy and build rules and algorithms and models, you know, uh, uh, AI models, machine learning models, and install those in our gateway. So that when the claim hits our front door, we are, for lack of a better term, pre-adjudicating or editing uh, that workflow and interacting with the provider to make sure that when that claim finally comes through and passes through the health plan, it's timely, it's accurate, it's coded properly, it is, it's, it's met medical uh, necessity criteria. It's you know, all the things that might you know, land in a work queue after the fact are targets for availability to drive 
efficiency and, um, and frankly, this digital revolution uh, through our gateway. So, and there's tons of models, right? You look at, like I said, payment integrity, the authorization uh, management process is exceptionally broken. Um, we've got to create a process where you and I as patients can know, uh, you know, in real time that the procedure we need is authorized or, or not. Um, so that's another example of where we're really trying to drive that workflow up into a real time payer provider workflow and out of this, you know, human uh, engaged uh, post uh, encounter post visit, uh, um, you know, work workflow where it exists today. Absolutely, yeah. No, thank you for that breakdown. By the way, I, I was I wanted to bring it back to availability since you were talking about the strain relationship, and uh, I mean, you know, part of part of the reason to bring that up was also to kind of hear. I like to hear from both sides, right? I like to hear the problem, and I like to hear how you're solving yeah. it. So I appreciate that. We, but when, before we started recording this, you and I were talking about basically uh, coming home for the holidays and air, airline price fluctuations yep. and things like that. And we, we brought up a little bit about the latest variant and how that was kind of either positively or negatively affecting the prices of uh, tickets. Can we talk a little bit about the kind of impact that the pandemic as a whole has had on the provider and payer relationship as well? Yeah. Um, so I want to say something that's probably controversial, and I'm good at saying controversial things. Um so obviously the pandemic, one of the worst things as a country, as a, you know, as a, as a, as a planet that we've been through, certainly in, in my lifetime, right? I'm, I'm an old dog uh, a bit compared to, to most, but, you know, my lifetime, you know, I've never seen anything quite like this. Um, with that said, what we saw, and again, sort of sitting at that intersection of the relationship between plans and providers is a very high degree of collaboration between plans and providers and how they did business together and how they served um, uh, patients, how they how they served, whether you call them members or patients, sort of depends on which side of the, the aisle you're on, but how they served you and I as consumers of healthcare. And um, I do believe that there are a number of sort of, you know, horses that got out of the barn during the pandemic uh, around how technology gets used and how processes are being reformed that um, were to a large you know, degree sort of um, accelerators of the adoption of uh, technology and healthcare, and I think they're here. Uh, they're here to stay. I think the adoption of telemedicine is a great example of something that was moving at a decent pace, but you saw just accelerate tremendously. You saw payers uh, find ways to make sure that they could approve uh, telemedicine claims and make that part of their uh, contracting processes. And providers got very creative in you know how they put telemedicine to work in their own uh, own businesses and. From where we sit, from you know, primarily at least today, uh, that administrative workflow, we saw payers and providers get very uh, creative around you know how do we take the paper and take the facts and take the phone calls out of these processes and automate you know leverage digital technologies, leverage new um, new capabilities to start to automate some of what have just been historically you know very manual uh, processes, and I think. You know, necessity is the mother of invention. I think as we sent hundreds and thousands of people home and as people, you know, couldn't work and as you saw spikes in utilization, um, it, it created a demand for automation that, you know, candidly was a little bit languish, uh, languishing in our in our historical healthcare system. So I think the net positive, and it's probably one of the few net positives out of, uh, out of COVID is it has created uh, from where we sit, you know, our vantage point, a much higher level of collaboration between health plans and providers around adopting and delivering um, information through technology. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, uh, I, I always tell people when we talk through pandemic, it brought obviously a lot of bad, but it also brought a lot of good. It really kind of pushed us forward several years into the future from a technology standpoint. And uh, just even from when you look at like just working from home, right? This was not a, a thing. No, no, we're not going to work yeah. from home. Maybe one day a week if you're lucky. Right? Great example. And now it's like, I don't think we'll ever go back to potentially full every day in the office. It'll be probably more of a hybrid model, but I, I think it also depends on the type of business you're in, right? Well, and to your point, right? I mean, health system, we, have, we serve you know thousands of health systems, large health systems. And you know they sent everyone home with their computers. Well, no one took a fax machine home. So very quickly yeah. you had to figure out how to get an authorization you know, move from a plan to a provider. Uh, without using a uh, fax machine. And that sounds like a silly example. It is a, you know, 
it is a very real example in healthcare of where we had to innovate quickly to be able to continue to provide quality patient care and 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 you know run the businesses the way they needed to be needed to be run. So I, I completely agree with you, and I, I don't think we're going back to. We're certainly not going back to where we where we were. We're our business, you know, we're thirteen, fourteen hundred employees now. We've been remote since March tenth of last year. You know, I've got a you know, sixty five, seventy thousand square foot building that we'll continue to use and it'll be an important part of our of how we work, but it certainly won't be the be all end all that it was uh, that it was uh, previously. Yeah, and I think the companies that understand that will we'll continue to, to flourish and do really well. The ones that don't, uh, people will be looking for other opportunities because they're kind of used to this structure. Exactly. Uh, when, when even an Amazon, right, is starting to let people work from home, that's when you know this is uh, you know, very transformative. Yeah, yeah. Well, La- your business, last question. you relocate to, you know, from the Northeast to, to Florida and able to run your business every bit as well from uh, from there because you remember. You don't skip a beat. Yeah. Yeah, you don't skip a beat either. I mean, uh even coming down here, you can work every single night that you're driving down to, to move down here, right, and get everything done that you need to. So, yeah, you're 100% right. Um, it, it's nice. It's definitely nice being able to do that. Although I probably need to get outside more. It's, we're, we're in sunny Florida. I, I don't get outside enough. And, yeah, that's that's kind of where we're at. But I have a, I have a one last question for you, Russ, before we wrap things up. And hopefully we can have you come back on again and we can go through some other issues. And I'd really like to put together kind of a little panel. We can just talk about the overall state of healthcare really sometime. Uh, maybe, maybe we can get Leon uh, as well. We'll, we'll see. Um, but, uh, yeah, so basically as we close out the year, what, what are you kind of for industry yeah. initiatives? What are you really watching out for in 2022? And then I guess really what's next for availability? These are kind of three yep. in one, but you can kind of hit them quick, I guess. Um, yeah. And then what are basically the next steps for, for payer provider collaboration around those initiatives? Um, and that's that's really my, my last question. to, to yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll give you my short version, perhaps next time we get deeper into it. So, so like I said, I think that the, you know, I think that we've sort of, we've, we've, we've experimented over the last couple of years with levels of automation that are going to become part of the norm. And I think as we talk to, again, kind of the unique place we sit, right? We've got this massive cohort of health plans that are our, what we call our gateway customers, where we serve all of their um, membership, all their connectivity, connect all their providers. And then on the provider side, we have a, you know, 2 million active providers, as I said, in our network. And, you know, I just think the level of collaboration is here to stay. I think there is, um, as we engage with our customers, there's absolutely a move to automation. I think that is a, a concept that you're going to see played out. And I think, Jared, a lot of concepts that have kind of historically struggled uh, in, in healthcare. So clinical data exchange as an example of, of you know, great concept, but with a historically sort of struggling business model, I think you're going to see gain traction as we find ways to leverage that content to drive automation of uh, workflow processes in healthcare. So that's what I'm excited about, right? We, we spent um, some significant time last year really retooling our five-year strategy. And, you know, for us, it is all about that digital transformation. I know those are buzzwords that, that everyone um, uses, uh, you know, to, to me, um, something is, you could argue, we've been in the digital business for 20 years, right? Company's been around 20 years. To me, you know, digital transformation is about a better user experience, better content served up appropriately in ways that both the user can learn and the content can can educate, right? And I think you're going to see more and more of that, right? So in our world, moving from this transactional, you know, provider submits an eligibility request and gets an eligibility response to to in a digital world that that eligibility request is a triggering event that says, you know, Jared is going to the doctor. A doctor just checked to confirm that Jared has health benefits. Okay, that's great. We need to answer that question, but that's a triggering event to begin an encounter that should result in a very healthy information exchange before you ever walk into your doctor's uh, office. Not unlike Amazon, right? I mean, I go to Amazon looking for a chair to you. I've got these two beautiful Golden Retriever puppies. I go to Amazon looking for dog biscuits. Okay, well, now they know I'm looking for dog biscuits. What else, based on my buying patterns, my use patterns, might I need for our for our puppies uh, 
uh, today. And I think you should have the same kind of experience in, in healthcare that when I walk into the physician's office, that physician should know, you know, Russ is coming into my office today because he's got a hip problem. I've confirmed benefits. I've already got an auth approved for an x-ray or a scan because he's probably going to need it. And I've got the referral network set up and ready to go. If I need to refer him out to an orthopedic surgeon, right, then I've got that set up and I'm going to have an intelligent conversation with him to say, here are your options. Here's what it's going to cost you. And let me help you get that referral made and an appointment set. That's the experience you and I, I think, are entitled to um, for the premiums we pay and the, the fees that we pay for healthcare. And our job as a company, I'm kind of answering it all in one, right? Our job as a company is to help help you and I as patients achieve that experience. 100%. Yeah, hopefully we can maybe dive into this more on the next time that you come on. But thank you for the, the quick version. Really appreciate it. And uh, wish you all the best. Wish avail uh, Availability all the best. And um, look forward to having you on again real soon. Thanks for your time today. Yeah, thanks for your time. Appreciate it.